Professor Masia, our Vice Principal of Student Life, Professor Yuan Yuber, who is presenting the inaugural address this evening, members of the Executive and Senior Management, the Head of Department for Industrial and Systems Engineering, Professor Yadavali, Deputy Deans, Chair of Schools, Heads of Departments, faculty and staff and distinguished guests. Good evening, welcome and wonderful having such a large number of people attending this evening's inaugural address presented by Professor Jan Joubert in the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology. For me, it is a great honor and privilege to introduce to you Professor Mosio, who will now introduce the speaker. And without further ado, I now present to you Professor Mosio. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Maharaj. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Inaugural addresses are uh, auspicious occasions in which we celebrate remarkable academic achievements of our colleagues. And these are truly distinctive university traditions that span centuries, and they provide opportunities to not only celebrate their academic endeavors, but to give recognition to the impactful research and new knowledge they generate. For those involved in academia to sit back away from the pleasures of work and listen to an esteemed colleague with undivided attention. It is from these occasions where different and usually exciting perspectives emerge. For those sitting outside the disciplinary field like family members, relatives, friends, and so forth, to get a peek into and witness the result of many years of hard labor and ensuing rewards. And also it is for the speaker to share with the world a portion of what excites them, but also to share solutions to the many challenges we face in many facets of our lives. It is an honor for me to introduce to you this evening, Professor Johan W. Joubert, Professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at, the, at our esteemed University of Pretoria. In his inaugural address titled, Mobility Inequality, Taking Small but Deliberate Steps, Prof. Joubert will unpack the challenges of various modes of transportation. I will leave that to him to share with this august gathering. And after completing his undergraduate studies at the University of Pretoria, Prof. Joubert started his career in industry, first in the food and beverage sector, and then moving into consulting. The generalist nature of consulting left him much, you know, at wonder and, and he was not quite sure. So, well, it didn't appeal to his learning nature. So he started feathering his studies. When an opening as junior lecturer became available at the end of 2001, Johan joined his alma mater at the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. He gave himself five years to complete a master's and a PhD, planning to return to industry as a specialist, or so he thought. But his timing was perfect. The three months to spare of his five-year plan, he successfully submitted and defended his PhD. But then the research bug beat him and as they say, the rest is history. While completing his PhD in Industrial Engineering, he simultaneously completed a postgraduate qualification in higher education. And since then, he has been enjoying academic life. He teaches at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels on operations, research topics, specifically industrial analysis and simulation modeling. During the past 20 years, Prof. Joubert has, has held ex, you know, extended contract research positions 
at the Council for Scientific Industrial Research's uh, Transport Tech and later Built Environment. In 2009, Prof. Joubert packed up his wife and love of his life, Marilise, and their two daughters, Donne and Noelani, and complete, completed a one-year research visit at the esteemed Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, as we call it, in Zurich, Switzerland. He was a visiting professor at the Institute for Transport Studies at Boku, the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. He was a postdoctoral fellow of the Mobility Cultures in Megacities program hosted by the Technical University Munich and the Institute for Mobility Research, a research facility of the BMW Group. With his inquiring mind, a strong learning drive, and recognized capabilities as a problem solver and opportunity developer, Prof. Joubert has managed to build up a rather impressive publication record, particularly in his specialist field of transport and transport modeling. He has published 44 articles in accredited journals, 41 published conference proceedings, eight book chapters and presented at numerous local international conferences and workshop on decision-making in transport. With his knack for viewing things holistically, he, he also has a track record of research collaborations with interdisciplinary journal articles produced in collaboration with colleagues in various fields, such as engineering, physics, anthropology, fine arts, geography, environmental sciences, and computer science. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have vested interest in transportation, but the transport decisions faced by the government, the freight industry, and the population today are frequently and only vaguely defined. These transport problems are challenging because they are multifaceted. What is suitable for the government is not necessarily beneficial for the industry's sustainability. What is cheap for the operator may often be bad for the environment. What is probable for the industry may hurt the pocket of the poor in living rural, peri-urban and urban peripheral settings. And then, to add to these uh, trade-off challenges, the underlying data on which we have and on which we base our decisions is uncertain, stochastic, faulty, vague, or simply absent. But these decision-making uncertainty challenges are what fuel Prof. Joubert's curiosity. And it is within this context that we look forward to his exciting inaugural address this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Prof. Johan W. Joubert. I thank you. Professor Mosia, Professor Maharaj, thank you very much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, I really would have loved to present this inaugural lecture in person, um, but this format allows many more of you to actually join. So I'm very, very happy that you would um, be able to, to spend some time and, and join this evening. I'm an industrial engineer by training, um, <clears throat> and we are also affectionately called BCOM engineers because we understand and appreciate the business side of engineering. Uh, and then we're also called soft engineers, since there's a lot of human involvement and we have an appreciation and an understanding to, to take that into account when we develop business systems. Uh, because you can have a wonderful piece of machinery, a nice piece of equipment, and then ultimately when you put it in the hands of an operator, things go boink, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty. Now, <clears throat> I want to use this evening in terms of reflecting in terms of this inaugural lecture in what got me here in terms of what influenced research direct, my uh, research direction in, in trying to understand 
um, mobility and transport, kind of in, in, in more general terms. Now, I'm very fortunate to have both my parents in the audience. Um, they showed me from a very young age in terms of what hard work actually looks like. They didn't, they didn't teach me that, they showed me that. Uh, and that has kind of rubbed off over the years. And I'm super appreciated um, of them. And mom, dad, I salute you and, and thank you for the opportunity. But in working hard, I actually got it right uh, to, to really have a good work-life balance at the end of the day. Now, that might sound kind of awkward, um, but, but I really had the opportunity to invest all of my energy in only being one person. I didn't have to ever try to have a work yuan and then have a family yuan and a week and a weekend yuan and different versions. I could invest everything in one uh, particular um, person. And that is mainly due to me sharing kind of this life with the super girls. Uh, and it would be completely wrong to, to not... Uh, say thank you so much that I can take my work home in terms of research. I find research incredibly personal um, and you'll hear tonight in some of the stories in terms of how it actually influenced me. So I get to take work home. I get to bring my family into my home environment and I think that makes for authentic research to some extent. So Marlies, Dunay, Lance, I love you to bits. Thank you so much for the opportunity to actually be here and, and kind of be acknowledged in this setting. Much of it I actually owe to you in terms of being able to, um, to achieve what I've actually achieved and having a heck of a lot of fun along the way as well. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, I'm, I really, really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> but then I'm also super fortunate in terms of this process um, to look up to an older brother that I can knock on his door anytime and just look up and, and just get some advice in terms of this, this work-life um, thing. And he would usually just remind me and say, hey, just walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Come on, keep company, keep company with me and I'll show you how to live freely and lightly, right? You, you just have to love an older brother that you can look up to. Um, he's the spitting image of, of his dad, um, of my dad. Uh, and I'm really super happy to be able to, to have this conversation in terms of, of mobility this evening. So <clears throat> the title of my talk is Mobility Inequality. And I really have a long standing relationship. I get to come to campus uh, frequently uh, and look at the old arts building. And I have a long kind of history with the, with the Old Arts Building. I'm lucky to have been able to study here. Um, but there really is a pretty long history. And more recently, about well, 12 years later, the picture hasn't changed of the Old Arts Building all that much. Um, and the story still continues. And I'm super proud to be able to say that two of these gorgeous kids are currently studying engineering here at Tuckies, and the third is about to register as a student. So it should then actually not come as a surprise that much of the research influence come from real life experiences. And that to me is important. Maybe as a soft engineer, it becomes even more important. But some of these pivotal moments are what actually changes direction. Um, and as I grew up, not just as a, as a person, but also as a researcher, I kind of realized the, tr the tremendous amount of, of privilege in being able to do research in, in this particular field. And along with this privilege comes authority. Um, a huge, we've been, we've been blessed with a huge amount of, of authority. And as Rick Warren says, what are we doing with this authority? Are we, are we speaking up for those without any authority. So life throw pivotal uh, events your way and research is part of my life. And I think we all experience life. Well, maybe some people experience it as separate from, from their work environment, but life is very, very personal. And I really like the way in which C.S. Lewis put these pivotal moments that actually change the course of, of direction. He says, God whispers in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. Um, 
It says megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So it seems somewhere we're missing things along the way and we need to be shouted at from time to time. Um, but what I want to do in this particular talk, when you talk about mobility inequality, is I have a vested interest in understanding and helping to contribute and hopefully improving to some extent the state of what I refer to as mobility equality. What do I mean with that? I use this two-word phrase to try and capture two questions that haunt me, um, or rather that drive me um, every day. And the first question is, who gets the benefit of an intervention, or who gets the benefit of infrastructure? And then the flip side of that same coin is, who pays for that benefit? And these are two really, really hard questions. And, and we often argue with personal experience, which is very biased, with anecdotes from other people. But when it comes to evidence-based decision-making, we really do not do very well here. So <clears throat> looking at this picture again, there clearly is something unequal happening here, right? And we can argue that maybe we need more infrastructure, another lane. Do we? Who will get the benefit of that lane? Yeah, the people on the right, I agree. But should the few people on the left then also be paying for that benefit? They won't get any benefit from an additional lane. Fewer lanes won't even uh, bother them at all. But these buggers on the right, they like living in the east of Pretoria. And they like living, oh, sorry, and they like working in Joburg, in Rosebank or Santon. And they like choosing to not use the heart train. Hmm. So who should pay for their choices? Shouldn't they? And let me just enlarge this quickly so that you can help me identify those pesky vehicles, the trucks, right? Those real problem child on the road. Well, I only see two. So the question is, why do we want to ban them off the highway? And I find it interesting because we all want our fresh goodies at Woolies or the checkers here at Loftus, but we don't want to see any trucks on our road. So I agree that I'm simplifying the matter, but what I want to bring home is that mobility inequality is really hard to address. It's not, it's not that simple. And luckily, we don't just go and build another lane and just implement our, our choices. What we typically do is we would first build a model, some abstraction of reality that hopefully resembles reality. And then offline, when we have time in a cheaper way, we would then test a whole bunch of what if scenarios and hopefully pick the one um, that is most appropriate uh, for the problem at hand. Now, <clears throat> I've been able to to work and be privileged to work in this field of building these transport models for my pretty much my entire career. Um, and, and the one thing that I've realized kind of early on is that models also are not created equal. You typically start with what I call a descriptive model on the left hand side. This is usually the starting point. This is just to be able to get a handle and describe what you're seeing, the world around you. Um, we call it exploratory analysis. We call it summary statistics. Very often it's just describing, and, and that's the first point, or, or the starting point. And then we get to prescriptive models. So once you've looked at the past, and you've got some handle in terms of, all right, I see the patterns, can you actually predict what the future will look like? Uh, and this is very often the next step. But those of you that read Nassim Taleb's work will probably agree that we really suck at this. We don't do this very well. And then prescriptive models or optimization models are those type of models where we prescribe what the optimal course of action is. We've got an objective function and the problem is in real life these are super fragile models. Because there are more than one objective and they pull us in different directions and the data on which we build these models are uncertain. At best, we can describe them stochastically, and very often they're simply not even there. It's just absent data. Um, so I completely cringe when people use the phrase and say, we're optimizing something, because optimality is a mirage. All right, but here, let me just interrupt myself 
because whichever one of these three models you pursue you will most likely have to start somewhere by looking at um, past data and you will be reliant on past data things that you can measure I call them events things that are measurable at least now <clears throat> I want to use a transport illustration to explain what an event is recently a couple of weeks ago I got to put a camera right there on the button at the top of the admin building overlooking the intersection of Linwood Road and University Road and what we are measuring are events we're counting the number of vehicles that carry straight on over the intersection how many turn left how many turn right how many trucks are there how many cars how many pedestrians how many cyclists uh, we look at the the acceleration the following distances and we can study a whole bunch of things but they are all just events things that we can measure and we used to put students on the sidewalk there with a clipboard and they would do the, the traffic counts for us now and that was the purpose of this video is to do video analysis and we can throw fancy machine learning algorithms at it to do that in an automated way but it's still just events and the argument that I'm trying to make here is that when we look only at events, past historical events, all we get to do is predict future events. You can inflate it a little bit to account for growth. You can manipulate it if you have some assumptions, but it's based under assumptions. But you look at events and all you will do is predict future events. Whereas in fact, events are the result of underlying behavior. People's and real people's real choices so when you look at this intersection again you kind of you can look at it differently why did that person turn left at that intersection is it maybe because they live in Arcadia and they're on their way to drop their child at the primary school down here in Linwood Road um, why did they carry straight on were they maybe on their way to pick up their child at office and take them to the medical center here at Loftus Park what's the real choices behind it and that little person that just arrived at the intersection in the blue car, uh, they might be usually in the taxi, but today they had to go by car because they've got some other activities that they need to tend to. Mode choice. So there's a lot of behavior happening and the behavior changes over the course of the day and so does the events because schools come out at this specific time. And if you know the area, there are five schools in the direct vicinity. Again, the argument being that if we look at the data differently and we start analyzing it and, and, and interrogating it differently, we get handles on behavior. And then as we start twisting and twe uh, twitching these behavior, we will see it manifest in terms of events. And that is super necessary. Because otherwise, if you only have events to work with and no behavior, that's all you'll be able to predict in the future. So we need to understand behavior first before we can actually make progress in this field. And then behavior is a function of structure. And structure is infrastructure, the sheer amount of available road space. Uh, structure is also the socioeconomics of an environment. Can you afford a car? Um, are you reliant on public transport because you don't own a car or cannot afford a car? Can you afford the schools in this area? Um, so there's a lot of structure underlying and we're only at the point of skimming the surface to understand behavior really and the structure and the influence that they have on one another. The state of practice, what real decisions are made in practice are right here at the top at the events level. And a large part of my, my kind of research career so far has been to drive an agenda so that we can actually look um, and improve the quality of our models so that we can bring in behavior, behaviorally sensitive models, and that we can ask smarter questions from our models. Now, <clears throat> this next image is probably the most beautiful one that I've ever created in my career so far. It was never published, didn't appear in a single publication. It's just events, but it has a story. And as a soft engineer, I like telling stories. So what you're looking at is a representation of all of the truck movements across Southern Africa over a 24 hour period. It creates this narrative. Hmm. OK, so you want your fresh goodies at Woolies, right? Trucks are the nerve system of the economy. 
right? You, you get that picture in terms of the nerves inside the body. I find it gorgeous, maybe because I created it. But I'm still super grateful to Dion Duran to add the insight and was just willing to give me access to the data about 15 years ago. Uh, back then, I actually had to build up a skill set to blindly poke at hundreds of millions of lines of data. This was before big data was a thing. You can't open up these type of files on, on any computer. So you had to blindly and systematically work your way through it. And that skill set in terms of working with very large data sets um, changed in terms of future projects that I were able to, to, to look at and work on. Um, but also in terms of visualizing it properly so that you can tell a compelling story. Because what I very early realized is that it's easy to impress people actually. You use big words, complex sentences, uh, and equations, and it's easy to impress them. But in order for them to really hear a compelling story and with a vivid picture in the mind in terms of what you're trying to do, make them actually appreciate what you're doing. And I found that super important um, because only then do they understand what you're doing. And these skill sets build up over time and influence the way in, in which we went about doing our research. But this figure is still just events. Right, Joshua Bloch puts it so eloquently, he says, small is beautiful, but simple ain't easy. So the next step was to actually take these events and slice and dice them in a completely different way. Right, so what we then did, <clears throat> and this actually started with, with another story in 2000, and um, 2009, when I shared an office with um, Matthias Kowalt in Zurich. He was at the time a PhD student of Professor Kai Oxhausen um, at ETH. And Matthias was a sociologist. He studied social networks, how people travel together to go and have a beer. And I learned that this applied to freight too. And I started actually a whole new stream of research studying the connectivity the behavior, not of how trucks move, but actually how companies connect with one another. But we had to study the data very differently, not focusing on events, but looking deeper for the behavior. And Nadia Trent has since taken this to a whole new level, and there's a lot of work still to be done in this field in terms of understanding what we're doing um, in terms of freight behavior. And Volner Bean and I are working on, on the behavioral responses that you can actually see here. Now, now you might look at that connectivity graph and say, but yeah, I, I, I kind of understand that. Yes, you may know that for your suppliers and you may know who your customers are and you may know where your trucks are. Number one, you're not necessarily willing to always share that data and you might ask, but why should I? but you don't necessarily understand it for the system as a whole. And hopefully these questions will become clearer as I go through the presentation. All right, so long introduction to actually get to the table of contents. So what I want to do with this presentation is just to share how personal real experience uh, created stories that we can tell that impact the research direction. And these images are courtesy of Susan Wolf, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that just now. But suffice to say is as we push the boundaries and as we study behavior instead of just events, we realize that this behavior thing is pretty tricky. It's the driver, but studying behavior is no, is no trivial task. And hopefully if I can stay within my 40 minutes, I will let you in on what we're busy with right now. So <clears throat> back to the different types of models. If we ask tougher questions, if we ask why, from our data and we try to understand why we observe what we observe and we don't just try to describe it but actually ask why do we see this? Then you can move from a space that we call descriptive models into one that I call explanatory models. Explain the why, what you're actually seeing. And then if you decompose a complex system uh, in terms of a predictive model and you start studying the relationships between the components of a complex system, and you ask, why does this work the way that it works? And you start putting it back together. You build simulation models that are way better forms, in my view, of, of prediction that can actually capture that behavior because you've asked 
why. And then prescriptive models are pretty much about the why because you need to understand the relationship between the objective function and the constraints and the variables, etc. But it's only useful if you challenge some of the assumptions. They remain some of the most fragile models. And my concern very often is, is when you look at this whole portfolio of different models that you can actually build, um, people tend to say, ah, oh, this model. I mean, models, models that they just don't work. When in fact, they should actually be way more critical of the model builder responsible for putting this stuff together. Now, I've been privileged to toy around in all of these fields in terms of model building. More recently, I spend a lot of my effort and enjoyment as well in terms of looking into explanatory models with Dr. Alta Duval in studying the travel behavior and explaining the travel behavior of people. I do some prediction, mainly simulation modeling. But it all started, like all good stories, a long time ago in a land far, far away from here. I was sitting in a tram, um, Dresden, and I was looking out the window and there was an old lady walking towards the tram. About five or ten meters away, she saw the tram door shut and the driver sped off because the driver had a schedule to keep to. And I thought, this is, I am dumbstruck. That won't happen in South Africa. In South Africa, <clears throat> we have the taxi system. And what you will see is that a taxi stop in the middle of the intersection and they would then um, hoot, look down, see an old lady a block and a half down and hope that she might actually join them on their trip to, to Mamelodi. Now, granted, the taxi driver will not have much concern um, for any of the, dry, of, of the occupants' time or probably safety that's already on the minibus taxi, um, but they'll wait. And I kind of realized that there's, there's some humanity in transit, um, seeing that kind of contrast. I'm not saying the one is right and the other one is wrong, I'm just saying they're so different. So after my PhD, we, we, uh, which actually looked at um, optimizing networks and, and logistics, we started applying it or thought that we would be able to apply it to, um, to public transport. And having an appreciation for maybe that's something worth studying in the minibus taxi industry, we thought, all right, in the perfect world, minibus will actually feed into bus and bus will feed into rail and rail will be the backbone of your system. And it sounded kind of utopian. Um, <clears throat> And you only need a car if you're either stuck up or you live out in the sticks or you really have very unique travel uh, reasons to, to actually travel. So we embarked, we tried to build the optimization model and very quickly we realized this is literally not doable. There's no literature that can actually help us design this public transport network. And the reason is all those algorithms require you to know where the bus stops are because your job in the algorithm is to connect them optimally with one another. But what happens in South Africa when you lift up your hand? You become a bus stop anywhere, anytime. And we realized, hmm, this might actually not work. So I collaborated with Susan Wolf, who produced all these beautiful kind of images um, as part of her PhD in anthropology and fine arts. I kid you not, it, it was a match made in heaven. Engineer meets people person, right? Um, I was so out of my comfort zone. Uh, it was awesome. And to, to this day, it's probably still one of the most cited papers in my, in my portfolio. Uh, I, had a, I had a heck of a lot of fun. And Sue, please forgive me if my kind of sizing of your, of your artwork is not, is not correct. Each of these hand signs tell a story. There's a story behind the origin and how people use the hand signs to actually communicate. So this actually opened up a completely new world for us. And we knew that capturing this dynamic in terms of a commuter on the fly communicating with a transit vehicle lends itself, this complex system with a lot of uncertainty lends itself to simulation. And this also happens to be at the start of um, kind of when agent-based simulation and multi-agent system raise its head. 
So we saw the opportunity and we built a prototype. In, we did it in an early version of AnyLogic and we were pretty chuffed because we got it right. We modeled an agent, a person, a commuter, to navigate from an origin to a des destination on their own. We didn't tell them, we just said, get to the destination. Um, and by the way, there's multi modes to, to actually choose from. And the agent were able, the agent was able to, to figure it out. So we were pretty chuffed <clears throat> because we had one agent, we had one origin, <laughs> we had one destination, but it worked. It wasn't scalable. Um, we can't model 14 million individuals using that approach. Um, <clears throat> so the journey kind of continued. So Peter Furi and I got um, on the plane and we did a road trip to Europe uh, where we met two groups who apparently were working on something similar, but theirs were a little bit more scalable. So we wanted to go and investigate. Uh, and that two week trip to ETH Zurich and TU Berlin is probably worth an entire um, presentation in its own right. Um, but suffice to say that we met the groups under the leadership of Professor Kai Axhausen and Professor Kai Nagel. Um, and that opened up the wonderful world of Matsum. Now in the process, and this is an incredible piece of machinery, um, it's definitely not ours. Uh, we just get to collaborate and, and see all the amazing developments that's happening. But in the process, we also develop this love-hate relationship with open source software. Um, now, <clears throat> my students here in South Africa think I'm a programming guru. Uh, I got a mug once from, from a group of students that said, he turns coffee into code. Um, and at the time, it was kind of funny because I really don't consider myself a great programmer. Um, I know enough to get myself into trouble and maybe sometimes enough to actually get out of trouble again. Um, and I sometimes think I frequently frustrate the crap out of my European collaborators. But be it as, as it may. It would be wrong at this point not to acknowledge um, those two research group, both under brilliant, brilliant leadership. Um, I have not seen two such superb researchers be so generous with their time, sharing their experience, sharing their knowledge, and actually it's way more than knowledge, it's actually wisdom um, so generously. So both guys, Kai Oxhausen, Kai Nagel, thank you so much for all those opportunities. Um, we owe you a tremendous debt. <coughs> and to their PhD sorry, students you, and master students. Sorry, Prof. We are sorry to trouble you. Uh, we can't see your presentation. Maybe you can uh, reload your slides or something. I will do that. Can you see me? No, we can't see anything. We can hear you, though. Let me just see one second. Is that better? Still not? Uh, nothing yet. Let me just switch off the camera and switch it on again. Yes, yes, that was good. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so all of the masters and PhD students that we met over years um, actually became longtime friends as well. So thank you so much for, for that opportunity. And then I had the privilege as, as um, when I was introduced to take, pack up my wife and kids and move to, to Zurich um, to work under Professor Kai Axhausen, probably the best career move that I've ever made. Um, Prof. Axelsen, thank you so much for, for the learning. And then every year or so, I get to sit and just watch Professor Kai Nagel program or reason through a piece of code and programming um, or a conceptual problem. And that to me is the absolute best way of learning. So thank you so much. But then I came back to South Africa and I realized that we don't even have a shared vocabulary uh, in terms of something as simple as the word transport planning. Meaning we want to plan for transport. Now, when you give this 
term to a civil engineer, they will tell you they think of infrastructure. And when you give this term to an to, to industrial engineer, they will tell you that they think of operations. Now, does this matter, this confusion? It turns out very much so. Especially if you keep those two questions in the back of your mind, who gets the benefit and who pays for the benefit? So the best analogy that I could come up with is that it seems that the designers of the board are ignorant of the rules of the game that's played on that board. Right, so imagine that you want to play chess on a Monopoly board. It doesn't make sense. Yet, that's what we've been doing for decades. Because you see, on the one side, you get government who's the custodian of the road infrastructure. That's the board on which we play this mobility game. And then industry, on the other hand, have got much shorter term rules according to which they play. For them, playing this game, logistics, logistics, um, is about answering questions such as, where do I locate my warehouse? What size of fleet should I have? Should I have many small trucks? Or should I have few large ones? Should I even have my own fleet or should I outsource it? Which customer orders go onto which trucks? What's the optimal route? Very, very short term. Right, so neither of these players, government or industry, is wrong. They're just different and they very often miss one another. But it's very easy and more intuitive to look at the problem from one company's point of view. Especially as a business engineer, you, you kind of tend to understand that. Yet the challenge is that government is responsible to design this board, not for one company, but for all companies to simultaneously play their game on. And also for the other road users, for you and me in our cars, as well as those in public transport. So answering this question is really kind of challenging in the sense that you then understand why there is tension. Because on the one side, you have government who's yelling at industry, please stop breaking our stuff. And when we talk about breaking, we're referring to overloading, we're referring to congestion, um, <clears throat> and then also one driver per vehicle commuting. But industry, on the other hand, is yelling back and saying, okay, but stop squeezing our business. And I want to argue that much of all of this tension still just boils down to answering these two questions in terms of who gets the benefit and who pays for it. Now, I'm of the opinion here, and this might be somewhat controversial, is that those who get the benefit are not very honest about that benefit. You see, we find it extremely hard to admit our privilege. Um, it's very hard for us to actually admit that we've gotten something and that we're actually in a position of choice, that we have the ability to choose. And especially in a country like South Africa with our economic inequality, um, <clears throat> you might know that there's this international, somewhat crude but efficient metric called the Gini coefficient, and we're second to last on the list when it comes to economic inequality. We're second only to our neighbors, Namibia. What is worrisome is that this metric has actually deteriorated over the past 25 years. So something we're doing wrong somewhere. And I argue it's because we don't have a very good handle on these two questions. Now, they aren't simple to answer. But are we making progress or are we just part of the crowd that points fingers and saying, oops. Now, there's a lesson that my dad taught me that I'm still trying to get over to my students, and that is that two types of people go nowhere in life. They who don't do what they're told, and they who only do what they're told. And we really try to be on the side where we try to push the boundaries and sometimes break the rules and step on a couple of people's toes. And one of those results have been to push the agenda for for a new type of, of model, to model things differently. Now, many of you have probably seen this animation, um, <clears throat> but let me just enlarge it. Every dot here represents an individual. And the color of the dot represents what that person is busy with. 
Now, if you don't recognize this, this is the city of Cape Town and Table Mountain is the green blotch just below the clock. So if we run this um, dynamically over a 24 hour period, and by the way, this beautiful visualization is courtesy of a cool tool by Marcel Risser, um, and it allows us to visualize a very vivid picture. And what we see is around about six o'clock in the morning, uh, you start to see people arriving at work in the CBD area, you start seeing um, Fort Tracker Road running from west to east and Main Road from, from north towards the southern suburbs. And you get this real dynamic picture in terms of what is happening in the city of Cape Town. There at seven o'clock, half past seven, you see a lot of green as kids arrive at, at school. And part of our country's problem, probably our Achilles heel, are those large blue blotches that you still see in the middle of the day, not participating in the economy because the poor is still on the periphery. The orange kind of dots that you see, kind of see uh, flickering are commercial vehicles. At least to my knowledge, this is um, one area where in the world where we always try to model people movement alongside with, with freight movement. So we introduce commercial vehicles at the same time. And what that, this allows us to do is to really, when we test an intervention, when we add a lane, when we move the container terminal from the CBD to Belleville, when we add a reserved bus lane, when we increase the frequency of the MyCity BRT system, who gets the benefit? Because now suddenly we can measure this at the individual level. Um, we don't just have the average person traveling on the average weekday in the morning peak period. May we never go there again. So these type of models allow us to, to push the boundaries. Now, <clears throat> part of the inputs into this um, is also kind of a, a, a bit of a cause of frustration in that we generated synthetic populations that are very accurate and realistic at both household and individual level. And that is basically just the result out of my sheer frustration and feeling so frustrated that I cannot tell my collaborators. And I think I probably missed out on a lot of opportunities because I can't put good data on the table to collaborate with. So we put a lot of effort over the past few years to try and improve that quality, publish it in the public domain so that these richly described populations are available for anyone to use um, kind of at no cost to really make the data open and accessible um, and that you can interrogate the process and how we actually went about generating it. And this then kind of spilled over into another field of, of research. So I became interested in accessibility. Now, <clears throat> the story behind this is that privilege can kind of bite you in the butt. And this kind of happened shortly after we returned back from Switzerland. Um, on February the 14th, Valentine's Day 2010. At the time, we were living in a gated community, a well-known security estate, and with very little warning, I had to run to my daughter's room, grab her in my arms and trying to keep her conscience as she went into seizure for 45 minutes, probably the longest 45 minutes of my life. And it's not because we didn't have access to medical facilities. It's because the security didn't let the ambulance through the gate. But it was such a wake up moment for me to realize that you may be close to facilities, but you don't have access. Or you, even worse, you may not even have access. So this drove me into a different direction. Well, not really different. We used the same synthetic populations and then to measure accessibility without the simulation, um, but actually to be able to, to quantify that accessibility in one way. So it started off as a very kind of brute force approach in measuring the accessibility, but it turned out quite efficient. And our collaborators yet again, luckily came on board and they help us refine it and make it way, way, way better. But these are kind of events in one's life that actually change or allow you to pursue new research directions. Now, I stumbled into this field of research, not from the engineering side, but from education. 
So Prof. Jonathan Janssen at the time was our Dean of Education um, and he held a workshop for his own faculty's young researchers. And I was finishing up, still busy with my PhD, but at the same time, I don't know, Selimi did another postgraduate degree in higher education. And so I got to see the invite and I invited myself. And Prof. Janssen kind of warned me that it's probably going to be very much directed towards the humanities, trying to warn me as an engineer, but I still went. And the workshop sold me on two very important ideas when it comes to research in terms of how this drives you answering hard questions. And the first one is the importance for you to work on a research identity. Who are you in terms of doing research? And in my case, I'm trying to come up with models that are good representations of reality. Be the translator between real problems and models that are worth solving. And the second thing that I learned is that what is research? It is the ability to anticipate where industry or what industry and government will need in five to ten years from now and start working on them now because otherwise those results won't be available. But this has been tremendously frustrating because both in the case of Matsum in South Africa as well as this accessibility, it's been a while for a while now. It's been around for a while now. Now luckily there are people with foresight that help invest in this and most notably people like Marissa Moore, who back then saw the opportunity for something like Matsum in the South African continent and the need to be able to model better. It happens to also be her that now bring this accessibility onto the radar of, of the World Bank. So we'll see where this goes um, as, we, as we move on. Now, one of the other frustrations in terms of research when it comes to playing in this field of modeling huh, is that simulation models always tend to produce something, right? And this is something I try to teach my students. I was guilty of this probably for a long time as well. And that is that when the model runs, that's but the first step. And very often we're so darn happy that the just thing the, the, the thing just produces some results, whether it's useful or not, but it's producing something. So it was not very surprising that more recently, maybe about two years ago, I was sitting in a meeting with a colleague of mine from mechanical engineering that I've got a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, Professor Skalk Els, and he made a comment where he said in a way that only Skalk can, I don't believe in simulation. And I thought, okay, I'm somewhat surprised because I've seen some of the super cool simulations that you guys do in vehicle dynamics. And his next comment got me really interested when he said, I also do not believe in experimental work. Now I was really curious because they spend lots of their time at Girotech doing field tests. So the, his next statement is probably to blame for my most recent adventure. And that is that when experimental work and simulation actually start getting together, start to inform one another, start to improve one another, that the real magic actually happens. So when we started in this field of environmental, environmental modeling using Matsum, we again started with a simulation model. Um, here we're using the most recent uh, Sunroll model that is available for Gauteng. So we settled up some new horses and to take us on a new great adventure. And the first step was to just build good agent-based models at the individual level where we model every agent, every vehicle. So what you see on the left is the aggregated results spatially over Gauteng over the course of the day in terms of the total amount of CO2 that is being emitted. At least that's what the model says. And then on the right, we can kind of translate that into a different way. Because we model every individual vehicle, we know how, each, how much each one of them are actually emitting. And now we can do this not just for normal light vehicles. We can do this for light heavies, which are kind of small, rigid trucks. And we can do this for articulated large heavy vehicles as well. Right, but it's simulation. 
So last year, and thanks to a number of funding partners, Department of Science and Innovation, but mainly our university, our faculty, our department, the NRF, we brought in Africa's first portable emissions measurement system. Now, this is a pretty expensive piece of equipment that you plug onto the exhaust of a vehicle and measure the emissions while you're actually driving. So here, in this picture, you see the faculty team that the students have affectionately dubbed the EBIT boy band. And um, this handsome guy on the far right is our, is our drummer. So most of this equipment you actually cannot see because it's in the back of the vehicle. So Ruan and I <clears throat> started to carry heavy equipment around and started measuring the emissions. And the next step in this research now is to really understand what is happening on the ground, not in the simulation model. Because when you buy a new vehicle, what you actually see is that in the windscreen they would put a little sticker that is pretty useless which will tell you what your fuel consumption is that you're not going to get and the amount of CO2 that you're going to emit which you're not going to do. Um, and that's kind of the legislation right now that we, that we actually have. But to understand what is really happening on the ground, we actually had to do a lot more field tests. So in the past couple of months, over the past year, we've really burnt our fingers. Experimental work is a completely different ball game. Um, but here you actually see how we've mounted it onto, a, on, onto the track, onto the road rail vehicle. And we will do many of these trips across Gauteng, um, different standardized routes where we measure the emissions as we um, would experience them in, under real driving conditions. Different times of the day, different levels of congestion. Why would this matter? Well, for us, we're trying to bridge the gap between experimental work and simulation. We already have pretty kick-ass simulation thanks to a lot of international work. But we, what you may not be aware of is that you are already paying for a carbon tax in South Africa. And you pay it as part of your fuel levy. So a long story to say, we're all the way back to the initial question in trying to understand and answer these two questions. Who will get the benefit of an inter environmental intervention or if we impose environmental infrastructure? And who will be paying for that benefit? And there are most certainly going to be a lot more stories to tell over the next couple of years. It has been an absolutely amazing journey so far. So at this point, I just want to thank you for sharing in some of these stories tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.